Hey, welcome to Mineral Talks Live, the weekly live webinar that brings you in-depth and in-person interviews with the mineral people from around the world. Mineral Talks Live is brought to you by a joint effort among the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, and Blue Cap Productions. Tune in every Wednesday and stay connected to your mineral world. Now, broadcasting live from beautiful Honolulu, Hawaii, the land of aloha, ukuleles, and shakas, this is Mineral Talks Live. Good morning to all of you, wherever you are in the world. Today is Wednesday, November 25th, 2020, and that means tomorrow is Thanksgiving here in the USA. From all of us at Mineral Talks Live, we want to wish you a very happy Thanksgiving wherever you are and with whomever you're with, even if it's just yourself. We hope you get a chance to reflect on the things that you're grateful for, especially in light of this pandemic. I know it's difficult for many of you out there, but we will get through this. Stay safe, stay healthy, and please don't let your guard down. So welcome to another episode of Mineral Talks Live, the weekly mineral talk show broadcasting you live every Wednesday. I'm Brian Svoboda, president of Blue Cat Productions, and I'm happy that you could join us today. For the people tuning in for the first time, Mineral Talks Live is a weekly webinar put on my, by myself representing Blue Cat Productions, Dr. Raquel Alonso Perez representing the Mineralogical and Geological Museum at Harvard University, and Dr. Eloise Gayou representing the Society of Mineral Museum Professionals, also known as the SMMP. For these shows, I'll be broadcasting to you live from Honolulu, Hawaii, while Raquel has a car packed way out in Boston, Massachusetts, and Eloise is in the middle of a dinner. Unfortunately, not today. She's dying. She's starving, but she's at some undisclosed location somewhere in France. Now, we share this information for you so that you understand that you're part of a global show, and it's your participation that helps to make the show what it is. How can you participate, you say to yourself, in your best German accent? Well, that's a great question, let me tell you. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of buttons. There's one labeled chat and another labeled Q&A. The chat feature allows you to type messages to everyone watching and participating in the show. You'll see that many people like to fire off a hello in the chat when they first sign on. We love this as it shows us where you're from in the world, so don't be shy. Give a shout out to your home city. Now, during the interview, our guests and I will be focused on our conversation and not really looking at the chat window. However, both Raquel and Eloise will be very active in those chats, so look for their comments along with everyone else's. At times, either Raquel or Eloise may interject during the interview with questions that you're asking so we can get an immediate answer from our guests while we're still on the topic. Now, the second way to interact is with the Q&A function. This this allows you to submit general questions that we'll try to answer at the end of the interview. So for those of you out there with ADD, and I know because I used to be the poster child, immediate questions, use the chat. General questions, use the Q&A. Finally, at about 40 minutes into the program, you may see a window pop up on the screen asking a bunch of questions for our weekly poll. These are questions we carefully curate for each guest. So come on, play along, and let's see how well you know our guests. And speaking of guests... Boy, you're going to want to put on a second cup of coffee for today's guest. He's a chemist, but not only that, he's a stratigraphic chemist who studies biomineralization. See, I told you you'd need a second cup of coffee. Ladies and gentlemen, I present a man who proudly loves his mineral collection of black uglies and lives by the personal motto, oxygen turns good minerals bad. Please welcome Harvard University Professor of Chemistry, Dr. Frank Koich. Frank, how are you today? Hi, thank you. I am fine. It's a real pleasure to uh, be here and talk to you uh, about, as Brian so politely put it, um, the, the sort of minerals and things I'm interested in, which, which really are uh, largely uh, not very sightly, but I find them fascinating and I, I, lo I love them very much. <clears throat> and so um, I, I just so people also know, I am actually currently in Germany. Um, so I'm in the same time zone as Eloise. Um, and I guess we'll just get started about this. And I think Brian will lead me and tell me what I should be doing and talking about. Oh, exactly. So, Frank, before we get too deep into your work and your collecting passion, I always like to dial look back the clock a bit and ask our guests what got you started in mineral collecting. So why don't you share that with us? Yeah, when I was really from a very young age, um, I, I was very outdoorsy. We went a lot outdoors. We went hiking. And that is really already when I started probably like five or six to start collecting minerals. And I think actually my parents were kind of sneaky in that what the way to get 
as motivated to go hiking and especially in the Alps up mountains was to say, oh, well, there's interesting minerals up there. They also did flowers and other things. But I think I sort of took to the minerals. And so I started from a young age collecting various kinds of minerals in the alpine mine, primarily in the mine dumps. So not, not like the Strala type collecting, but we'd go okay. to like a mine dumps and go collecting there. And I really liked that. <clears throat> and I continued that. And then I grew up essentially in the northern part of the Black Forest. And so when I was a teenager, I started going collecting there and into abandoned mines and getting things out. And I also really wanted to know what those things were. And, and um, that's sort of how I started, how I really started with mineral collecting. Well, now, so you had an interest in minerals and mineralogy, but you were told you couldn't make money with that. So you ended up turning to chemistry. And right now you're kind of combining chemistry and mineralogy as you explore the stratigraphic chemistry. Tell us about this. Yeah, so, what is this? So, yeah, when I, so I went to undergrad. So already when I was, was um, a teenager, I sort of did chemistry, the classical things you do with minerals to identify what they are, you know, blow a torch test and do chemical analysis of it. And so when I went for undergrad, um, to study undergrad in, in Munich at the Techn Technical University, uh, people sort of recommended at the time to me that really mineralogy in Germany, you know, there weren't that many jobs you could have. And they said, you know, why don't you study chemistry? There's quite this sort of overlap. And in chemistry, there's sort of lots of jobs. Ironically, Right when I finished with my undergrad studies in Germany was when the German chemical industry actually had a big downturn. So at that time, actually, everyone was telling people not to study chemistry because you couldn't get jobs in chemistry. <laughs> but, you know, but it all worked out well. And so I, I took mineralogy courses, some of them. So I'm not, I am not a professional mineralogist, but I took mineralogy courses during my undergrad. And I sort of continued being interested in it and, and doing sort of analytic work with uh, minerals. And, and then, as you said... I am now recently also starting to sort of get, also looking at sort of the the role of minerals uh, in the atmosphere as well. So that's something I'm, I, I, in the last few years, I've sort of been focusing much more on. <clears throat> well, now, Frank, I know that's a little bit uh, controversial, uh, and I want to make sure that our, our viewers understand that there is a very clear dividing line between the science uh, of what you're doing uh, as your job versus the politics of it. So setting the politics side apart, um, I thought it might be interesting for you to share with everybody a little bit about uh, the science of minerals and climates and what you're working towards here. Right, so this is a, um, it is an extremely controversial topic, um, but what I'm studying is trying to find out what the repercussions would be if you put um, particles, so the small particles below micron size, in the stratosphere <clears throat> to artificially cool down the planet. So this is where the political part is that uh, we don't need to talk about, but the idea is that you could do this in a sense to sort of temporarily try and, and cool down the planet. And what, what is known is that the naturally occurring aerosol that exists there it has a number of side effects that are quite disconcerting, including destroying the protective ozone layer, which protects us from UV radiation. So mm -hmm. one thing I've been investigating is whether there are other materials that have far less side, have less side effects, that don't destroy ozone and have less other um, side effects. And when you think about this, <clears throat> Thinking about minerals, something that is common on Earth's surface, really is, is a good approach because all the stuff you would put in the stratosphere would come back down, right? And if it's minerals that are common, like that are common as windblown mineral dust, then at least you kind of know how they behave where we live and you have a good idea of the risk is much lower. And so we're really, we've really started looking at a whole bunch of different minerals um, and what their impact could be both in the stratosphere and, and when they co came, come back down to the planet. Now, how do you go about testing something like that? Because I know that you were exploring a, a, a number of different minerals and one that's ideal. Um, we're not quite sure how it would react with um, uh, life on the planet if it came back down. Uh, how, do you, how do you test for something like that? Well, so we, so we first think about what the ideal mineral is. And, I, <clears throat> and ironically, probably the best mineral that you could use from a purely you think about really the mineral properties, the physical properties, the chemical properties. Actually, the, the, the really the perfect material for this would be diamond, which is 
sounds a little nuts because you know you put the hogs in the sky. But I but it's all really the delivery cool. vehicles would have to be called Lucy. <laughs> yes, that's probably <laughs> true. Um, but the idea really would be that that you know with diamonds that they they are chemically under those conditions probably extremely unreactive and they certainly wouldn't. So, so they certainly wouldn't have the ozone destroying chemistry that the natural uh, aerosol does. And um, other materials we thought about are, for example, limestone, calcium carbonate. We looked at we've we looked at the different titanium dioxide polymorphs, so rutile anatase and brookite. We've investigated. It turns out those are very poor candidates um, because they actually absorb UV radiation, and so they would really heat up the stratosphere. And so mm. we just look at all these different properties and think about what they could do and um, then we do lab experiments. So we actually try to simulate the stratosphere in our lab. We have a flow tube. We, we cool it down to stratospheric temperatures, pressures, and we try to evaluate, especially this ozone-destroying chemistry that, that's quite disconcerting. And so we use these mineral particles <clears throat> and then see what, what we think they would do to a sort of uh, our environment. Mm -hmm. um, and where this research now gets extremely controversial is the fact that I would... By the way, I would hope that most people would sort of scratch their head at the moment and think that this is entirely insane. And I just want to take a step back and actually tell you that when I first about this, heard about this, I thought this is an absolutely crazy idea because whenever we humans, and I'm actually not suggesting we should do this. So I'm only doing the research because I'm actually worried of all these side effects because we know as humans, when we think we have a fix for something in the mind, right, we're going to do this. You know, it's clearly guaranteed it's going to have some side effect that screws something else up, right? Right. And, and so I want to make clear that I'm not saying we should do this. But one of the things that also should be clear, when I, I'm trying to simulate the entire complexity of the natural system in my little one-meter flow tube in the lab, you know, <clears throat> I don't know how to say this, Kevin. Uh, being a Harvard professor, I have a lot of self-confidence. Some may say that Harvard faculty have other attributes that are not quite, that I can't say in polite uh, company. <laughs> but, you know, I think we're doing the best experiments, you know, that we can. But do I really believe that this one meter flow tube is capturing the entire complexity of the stratosphere? There's no way. That would be, even for me, that would be very arrogant to think that I know everything there is to do with that. So the problem is that only what you have to do is really find out how it behaves in the actual environment. And down here in the troposphere, there's enough well, there's not a lot of windblown diamond dust. I'll give you that. So that, <laughs> so, so that I perhaps don't know as much about. Um, that would be a very Just difficult. put a pout on uh, Eloisa's face. Yes, exactly. That's right. So so um, that would be very different. But, you know, there's a lot of limestone dust and mineral you know, blowing around. But in the stratosphere, it doesn't exist. So we actually also then have to do experiments where you put very small amounts, like a few hundred grams, into the stratosphere to actually see whether it behaves the way that our lab results predict. And, and um, that same thing, we, we're underway in planning to do this, you know, again, just a few hundred grams and see whether it reacts the way it does. One of the things that's kind of interesting for all of, you know, when you have calcium carbonate and you ha have it react with an acid, right? We all know the acid, you know, count, that's a way to get rid of calcite, right? You, you put it in an acid and it bubbles away. And in the stratosphere, you have lots of HCl, hydrogen chloride. You have nitric acid in the gas phase, all these things. One of the real surprises was you take this calcium carbonate, you take the limestone, put it under stratospheric conditions, and for like a minute, it reacts quickly with these acids, and then it stops reacting pretty much. It's passivated because it's so dry there that, you know, what I was thinking, I was wrong with this, and this is the danger. This is why you needed experiments because my hypothesis was entirely wrong. I thought, you know, limestone acid is going to react and boom, you're done. But actually, it's so dry that you have gas phase HCl and those things, and they actually just don't react with it. And, and that is something we found in the lab that I had not, in retrospect, it's obvious, but at the time, this was something that was, I hadn't predicted. And, you know, this is why you really have to do experiments. You can't just rely on theory and making predictions um, and then use model results. <coughs> So, uh, Frank, we have a question from Pete that actually is you. So what about the CO2? The CO2, you mean that comes from the calcium carbonate reacting? Mm, not I just, just, yeah. Yes. I, I don't want to make sure I uh, understand. Okay, what happens with the CO2? It's so little. So 
just to give you an idea, Mount Pinatubo put 10 million tons of sulfur into the stratosphere, cooled down the planets, say one degree Celsius, whatever. Um, and you wouldn't want to do more than that. And so if you put, you know, I think, let's say you put a million tons of, of limestone in the atmosphere every year. And let's say it all reacts away and that's roughly half the mass. That's half a million tons of CO2 per year. Through fossil fuel combustion and other things, we're putting at the moment 40 gigatons of CO2 per year into the atmosphere. So that's 40,000 times as much. So, you know, I'm not saying it's irrelevant, but it, it, compared to what we're doing, it's a, it's, a, it's a very small effect. But it's something we did a calculation on. You probably would put more CO2 in the atmosphere by actually having to have planes that take all the stuff up there and so on the production. But the actual amount of CO2 is negligible. <clears throat> now, Frank, it seems like this is uh, one of those interesting dividing lines because if you come up with a way to uh, combat global warming by uh, releasing minerals into the stratosphere, um, and if it's successful and there are no harmful <laughs> side effects, it almost negates or uh, tends to lead us in the direction of uh, not doing kind of the clean forms of energy that we're currently pursuing now. And I know that becomes, that moves it more onto the political <laughs> side, correct? Right. And so I want to be very careful what I say, but the biggest criticism of this research is in fact exactly this, this that when people, and so I always compare this method with, with opioids to make clear that it actually doesn't solve the problem. So if something's wrong in your body, right? Um, probably everybody in this audience at some point or another, or nearly everybody has taken painkillers, hopefully not opioids, but painkillers. And the, you know, the problem with painkillers is it actually, that, that themselves very rarely actually fixes the problem, right? Right. And so the danger of taking painkillers is because you don't notice the pain you sort of human nature tells you, I'm just going to deal with it some other time. And that is a really big risk um, with, with this research. And this, this is one of the reasons people are very critical of this research is that it should be clear to people that, and just to again, be clear, I'm just doing research trying to understand risks and benefits. I have, you know, I'm a scientist. I have no role in deciding what gets done anyway. That's policymakers. I, that, I, I have no mandate to do any of this. But what I will say is that it has to be clear to people that this is like a painkiller. It's not going to fix a problem, right? You will not, if you continue doing that, you know, if you don't cut emissions, you're not going to do anything about climate with this, right? So, and I can also say that because this is so, this research is so political, this is the first time I actually had to get an independent advisory committee that decides what steps we do in this research. So they, so I'm actually not in charge of my research. They tell me, what steps of the research I'm ready to do because of all those aspects. And as I know nothing about the political side, I don't want to do anything that's questionable in that direction. And so there's sort of an advisory committee that takes care of that. That also has nothing, to, it's not Harvard University, it's really an independent group of people that advise us. So in a way, it, kind of, it, it, it keeps your research clean of any uh, preference or any uh, uh, influence. Mm -hmm. Right. So, they, you know, they also make sure, you know, they, they control our funding. They make sure that in our funding, there's no, there's no vested interests that try to have any influence on our research so that our research is really independent. And I want to make clear that my research really is independent. I, my only role is to find facts in this and try to understand what the risks are. And that's all, that's all I do. I just provide information. Now, this is... Um I believe I'm using the term correctly, but this is going into the term of uh, biomineralization, where you're exploring how minerals interact with uh, biology. Is this, is this a correct Not understanding? Really. That, I, I would say that's a different research topic. Bio, okay. I, yeah, what I, fundamentally, yeah, I don't know what I would call what I'm doing. It's sort of the role of minerals in the atmosphere, in essence, which is, which is quite important uh, in, in many ways. <clears throat> but biomineralization is another really interesting topic that is not my research. I'm not an expert on, but I, I do believe that um, when I talk to other people uh, who, who are um, sort of re real mineralogists, you know, I, I'm not really a professional mineralist. I think biomineralization is one of those topics that you see quite often that, that is sort of a hot topic in, in mineralogy. Trying to understand how um, biology and if you so want, in organic 
chemistry, biology life interact with uh, mineralogy and inorganic things. And, and so how they influence each other, I think is a really, in my opinion, again, I'm not a, re- not a professional mineralogist. I think that's a really interesting topic where there's, I think, still a lot to be explored. And it continues to quite a lot about how the environment and how the earth works and how it evolved over, you know, on, on long time scales. It's really very interesting. <clears throat> well, I, th- I think it's interesting that you, um, you don't consider yourself a mineralogist and uh, you certainly don't have a, a, a degree in it to my understanding, but you have a very unusual hobby that if you were just to describe it, people would label you as a mineralogist. Mm-hmm. I mean, you like to describe new minerals and to date, you've identified somewhere between 25 and 30 new minerals. Um, what is what is the uh, the catalyst that drives you to do this? And tell us a little bit about your process. Yeah, so, so fundamentally, I think it's the same thing as, as what drives a lot of people, a lot of scientists, is the discovery of new things. It's just interesting. You know, from, I, I think... For most scientists, the things you understand are boring. You always want to find new and things you didn't know about that give you surprise and that are interesting. And so with minerals, one of the things I really find interesting is trying to understand better in my, in my black, black gray world, really um, what different minerals are out there and where, you know, especially with the class I like a lot are sulfur salts because they have very complex structures. I'm trying to understand how, for me personally, one of the things I'm interested in, how chemical changes induce, induce structural changes. How does it happen that when you start having substitutions with a different element, it suddenly changes structure? And one of the things we may get to and not talk about is that uh, in Uchul Chapa, I found these two minerals, which in a sense, both belong in the stannite group from the structure, but actually you do a substitution and suddenly it changes to word size structure. And, uh, I will actually say I don't quite understand why that happens, but I can ramble about that later. But my process fundamentally is, well, as a younger, I, I went to places and collected things, and now I don't have that much time anymore to go collecting, sadly. I actually thought during my sabbatical I could go collecting a lot, but certain current events have made that challenging. Impossible. Um, right. <laughs> so <clears throat> what I usually do is I keep my eye out for things that are unusual from places that I think are interesting, um, this is partly why I got why I've been doing a lot of work with Uchuk Chakwa. I look at sort of things where there's unusual combination of elements, and then I look at things that I find unusual, and then I start analyzing them. And 95, probably 95 percent of this stuff I have is utter garbage and just leaves again. And then five percent of them seem like good candidates. And so I first do um, SEM EDS, uh, powder X-ray on these, and that sort of narrows down and says, you know, there could be interesting candidates here. And after that, I continue. And for the material I use, we typically make uh, make polished sections, do reflected light microscopy, which I will say I think sadly is a little bit of a dying art, but it's extremely powerful. I I love reflected light microscopy. Mm-hmm. And so you do that, and then you can start seeing more structure. You can start seeing, are there things intergrown? Is this really one crystal of one, one mineral, or is it, is it all intergrown? Then, you, then, then we uh, usually do chemical analysis using quantitative electron mic- microprobe analysis. From that, we then try to get to structures. We, we, you extract, um, and most, a lot of the electron microprobe work I've been doing is together with a researcher called Dan Topa at the uh, National History Museum in Vienna. And then you try to extract a little single crystal area, make sure it's not intergrown too much. And in reflected light, it looks like there's no twinning. This is where life gets very difficult. And um, then you try to get structural data on these. And that's actually usually always the hardest part and the part where you fail off. So I'm sure mineralogists have actually found many, many more new minerals than have been submitted that I may describe. And in probably in most cases, that is because the phases are too poorly crystallized at the small, so you can't really get good structural data. And so you can't really describe, this is one of the questions, what is a new mineral? And so if you don't have the structural data, it's very hard to say what that mineral is. Now, Frank, I've got some images here. I'm going to pull them up on screen and uh, yeah. perhaps you can kind of talk your talk us through them here. <clears throat> yes. So this is an example of the kind of thing I do as I can't, 
travel as much anymore. So on the left top side, you see a photo of something that was offered at eBay from Shimen. Clearly, you can see the real guy. And then you can kind of see there are these black things on there. And those caught my eye. And I thought, well, that's worth looking at. And when the sample arrived, you can see on the right-hand side, this is, again, a photograph. I, I'm not a very good photographer. This is one of my photos. And you can see it's a nine millimeter freestanding crystal of a mineral, crystite. It's a thallium mercury arsenic sulfide. A lovely combination of elements, I will say. If that doesn't make your mouth water, um, <laughs> all good stuff. Tie your tongue first, just trying to say it. <laughs> yeah, that's a healthy mineral right there. Although it's probably insoluble. So, you, although you should never eat a crystal as nice as this anyway. But I was going to. Everybody thinks thallium mercury arsenic are very. They are very bad for you. But as a you hear that, boys and girls, don't eat your minerals. Yeah, although it's actually probably pretty insoluble. Um, so, and it turns out it's a nine millimeter uh, crystal of this mineral crystalline, which I think before that was essentially, you couldn't even get a piece of and was only known microscopically. So this is the kind of thing I get really excited about. So this is from Shiman. Okay, uh, let's go on to the next one here. And here's another example. That's probably the best specimen that I got from that. On the top, you can again see the sort of eBay photo. On the right, you can see it a little bit better. There's on this one, there's multiple one centimeter crystals perfectly terminated of this crystite, this mineral on there. Um, and you know, again, I, I'm, I'm obsessive, so everything on that specimen gets analyzed. And there are little black balls that, if you, if I told you what my children think they look like, it would be, uh, well, I could, they kind of look like, you know, shit. Hey, hey, watch uh, it. Anyway, so. Oh, and you take one of these and you make a, you know, again, we make a polished section. This is, and this is work, you know, this is Dan Topa did the analysis. You can see on this, Chris, on the, on the EDS image <coughs> down there that we have a dark main part with slight variations. These come from variations in the antimony to arsenic ratio. This is, um, the center is rebelite, another very rare thallium sulfur salt. And the bright rim on the outside is another thallium mineral called Yankovicite, where you have a, uh, it's antimony dominant. And so that's the kind of thing, you know, the things I really like are things that both have, in my world, I will say these are generally for the things I collect, absolutely enormous crystals. <clears throat> so, but at the same time, I really like that they're really rare and we can do analysis on them. So this is a, a, another example of crystite from Shimen. No, I think it's interesting that you're um, purchasing most of your minerals on eBay. It, it varies. I do a lot of mineral shows as well when there are mineral shows. Um, they'll, I'll, they'll, some may come up that I got at mineral shows. But again, here on the left-hand side, you see um, a specimen that was shown on eBay, and there was this weird black thing sticking down below. And I thought that looked intriguing, and I didn't quite know what it was. And it turns out that when you look at this, this is of another, this is now a thallium mercury arsenic antimony sulfide. Again, a wonderful combination of elements, if I may say so. Um, and it's a one centimeter perfect terminated, super high luster, has red internal reflections, crystal of this rubeite sitting on, on, on matrix. I mean, it's, it's etched out of the calcite, but... So again, another example, and you know, all of these specimens to really make sure that is, I analyze them. They get, um, we do various kinds, and there's other thallium sulfur salts that aren't on, as you can't really see on that specimen as well. So these were some, you know, the, I discovered these probably starting a few years ago at Shimen, and pretty much all the pieces I got from Shimen that had these amazing minerals on them, um, um, I, I actually got on eBay by just sort of looking around and spending time and. Oh, 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 what you're not is seeing are the 95% that are just garbage, right? So you see these and you think that's just a, well, I don't know what you think. and Perhaps you shouldn't tell me. Uh, I think they're amazing, but 95% is garbage, just to be clear. Okay. Now, uh, Uchichakwa in Peru is one of your kind of passion mm -hmm. areas. So I was hoping you could talk to us a little bit about that and uh, explain why it's so unique and why it's so different. Yeah, to me, Ucho Chakra is just an amazing mine. And um, I've done a lot of work on this starting 2012. So I was always interested in it because you have silver and manganese in it. And for me, if I take a little bit of a step back, in the sulfur salt world, for me, I would argue that in some sense, samsonite was like the holy grail mineral for me. 
And mm. that's from San Andreasberg. And it's the only silver manganese mineral from there. And silver manganese sulfide sulfur salts are extremely rare. And Utu Chakwa has this combination of silver, manganese. One of the things that's unique about Utu Chakwa is that a lot of the sulfur salts have both arsenic and antimony, and it, those can vary quite a lot. In many places, you have either antimony or arsenic. And so it just was mineralogically really rich looking. And then so it start, then in 2012, I, I always talk to dealers, and in 2012, um, and this shows you Utu Chakwa, it's also a really important silver producer. Um, by the way, it goes quite deep. It has lots of ore bodies. And one of these ore bodies in particular that was starting to be explored in, in, in the early 2010s had a lot of alabandite. In fact, the mine itself didn't like it because alabandite made the ore processing uh, much more difficult. So unfortunately, they actually don't really want to go after these areas. Yeah. And actually, I talked to a lot of dealers also from Peru trying to get speci specimens from there. And I also talked to... Um, John Bieber, and he actually gave me a specimen because I had been talking to him. He said, oh, you know, this is something, um, you know, is, is that kind of thing you were looking for from Uchuk Chakwa? And it turns out it was, and it turns out <coughs> that it, um, that was the first one that contained a bunch of new sulfur salts. And I think we'll see some facts on that later. And what we discovered afterwards as he studied it is, and also others uh, worked on this, Yarsa Lev Hischel also was part of all this effort is. There's also germanium in, in that deposit, there's tin in that deposit. So you get a really large variety. And so you can see here, this is a list of the sulfurs, of the sulfide sulfur salts for which Uchuk Chakwa is um, uh, the type locality. And you can see two were discovered early. And that's partly why I knew that it was interesting because there was a manganese silver sulfur salt in there, Uchuk Chakwa, it, described by Moelo in 1984. And then all the other ones after that were things that in one way or another came out of my research, except for Koichite, which when we get a picture of that, I can tell you how that came about, um, which was a big mistake on my part, actually, it turns out. That was named after you, and my understanding is it's only uh, <coughs> found in Peru and Germany. Yes, actually, only recently in Germany. Yeah, and, and actually, the irony of this is that when... I actually originally had some material of this and I did my preliminary work and I, I actually misidentified it. I thought it was tenantite. Like a, I thought it was a silver bearing tenantite. And then, um, so I had written it off and it was lying in some box and then, um, you know, others started looking at it and, and found out it was actually a new mineral. And so, so the irony is it's named after me after I actually uh, had misidentified it as some banal, boring thing. Well, there's your Harvard arrogance for you. Yeah. So, well, well all, you can put it more politely is that, you know, we, we all make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to admit it, but it happens quite often to me, actually. And so, yeah. And so I'll actually start, oh, yeah, the next one we'll see is, I just wanted to show that because to me, so there's all these really rare, exciting things that I get excited about that tiny, but I actually, this mineral smithite is the one where Uchu Chakwa has produced by far the world's best specimens. It's a, to me, I think this is really mind boggling. So what you see here, smithite originally came from the Lengbach quarry in Bintal, Switzerland. <clears throat> and you can see some very nice photographs that I, I, I took from Mindat largely, and I'm referencing the people who actually took the photos. And these are tiny little crystals of this silver arsenic sulfur salt. So you can actually see it has these, it has bright red color. You can see it has slightly different habits, sort of these elongated uh, 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 crystals. And then down below, there's a blockier crystal. And then if you go to the next slide, you can see what they look like at um, Uchuk Chakra. So what you see here is probably the world's best smithite specimen. So the picture width is about four centimeters. So the thing you see on the left-hand side, when I first got this in my hands, I actually first thought it was like a weird iron rose or something. It was very confusing. So it's about a two and a half centimeter group of big blades of smithite sitting on top of the matrix. And one of the interesting stories is that I actually got this at the Munich show um, in 2015. And I was always look at, on lookout for Chuk Chakra. So I went to this one mineral, the, 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 there's a sort of booth, 
and I spoke to the lady and she had like four pieces of Uchak Chakwa material, not very interesting on the table. Most of the other things were like birds and powered balls and other things. And so I just asked, well, you have any other Uchak Chakwa things? And so she had this big steel drum and she said, oh yeah, I have one. And so she's pulled out uh, this big steel drum, just stuffed, you know, pile on top of each other these pieces. And one is this piece, and you can see a close-up of the crystals on the right-hand side. That's about a six-meter close-up of some of the crystals. And they are super lustrous. They are dark red color. So this puts smithnite in a totally different category of mineral than uh, I think what it was from anywhere else before. And because I like it so much, I think I have a few more pictures of this. If you Yeah, you do. There we go. Here's another piece that just also shows the amazing how it occurs. So here it's quite different crystals. It's again more of these elongated crystals. And what you can see on the top right is fundamentally this is a piece of pure smithite about four centimeters wide, three centimeters tall. It's really spectacular. And you can see all these nice elongated crystals. The biggest ones here are about three to four millimeters. And in the middle you can see those see a piece where there's sort of two generations of um, of, of smithite crystals. So the bigger ones um, mm -hmm. Like this, and then there's all these other ones growing. And smithite has so many different habits at Uchu Chakwa. It's really mind-boggling. I don't know what. Here's another example of another piece similar to that. You have four millimeter crystals of smithite. Again, essentially a pure piece of smithite. So it's really, um, it's not the type of quality, but for this mineral smithite, clearly Uchu Chakwa by far uh, has the best minerals. I see a question in the chat that says, does smithite change color when exposed to light? That is a very good color question. My specimens essentially live in drawers. My hunch is it will lose, it will darken. It is my guess. Um, Brad, I can't, Zylman asked that question. My guess is yes, it, I, I would say very likely it'll, it'll lose, um, it'll darken. But again, this is something for everybody who's out there, they should keep an eye out for these smithites. Although I will say I have kept my eyes out and I haven't found more than 20 specimens altogether and probably only like five or six of, of, of really good quality, I would say. Yes, here, this is where it gets, this is more my, my, my sort of really exciting thing. Here you can see three minerals with um, Uchukchakwite, Menketiite, and Oyunite. And you can see, yeah, you look at that, the formula, they're all kind of very similar. So that makes life difficult. And on the left-hand side, you can see a one millimeter crystal. Not necessarily very big for Uchuk Chakwa, right? There's larger crystals from Japan. That is Uchuk Chakwa. If you go to this zone where all the manganese is, that's where you have all these antimony to arsenic variations. And again, this is a bad photograph on the bottom because I took it, but you can see all that black material on there when you get a close up. All the good photographs, by the way, are by Christian Rewitz in Germany. Um, you can see there's sort of three millimeter crystals and you think, well, that's a crystal, that's a mineral. And if you go on to the next one slide, this is what I do. I pick off one of the crystals. You can see those, see the outline of the, of the crystal on this. And when you make a polished section and, you know, uh, again, Dan Topper looked at this under the ultra microscope, these different shades of gray tell you that these are different chemical compositions. And you can actually see that this one crystal fragment looks like from the outside, one crystal actually consists of something like seven different minerals, right? Most likely. The problem is, and for those who are very sulfide interested, they can look at the detailed names. That's not really the point of this slide that I want to make here. But this is where mineralogy gets very challenging. There's a super interesting phase all the way at the bottom, this dark one, the thing I call the manganese copper arsenic which you check it. Clearly, compositionally, I guarantee that's a new mineral. But if you look at the scale, it's important for us to extract uh, any amount there so we can get really good structural data on this. We actually did some TEM work where we, 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 we iron milled out a part, put it on the TEM, and we actually we, we got sort of crystallographic information in two dimensions, but it was just it was not enough to really go after new mineral. But this shows you, again, for, also for these sulfur salts, when people write down that there's a, you know, on, on, and you buy something that's a sulfur salt, with sulfur salts, it's incredibly hard. You hardly ever know what you really have in there. And I have many, many examples of where, you know, I go get a rare specimen. 
especially of sulfur cells. And I would say in at least 50% of the cases, it's, it, it, is not what I, it is not what the label says. And this probably shows the problem, right? I mean, you, you, what do you call this, Meryl? You don't even know. I don't even know what to call this, right? It basically, none of those phases actually match, except for one little part, matches any of the described minerals. So what on earth do I call that specimen? And I call it the Chichakwite group crystals. That's what I call it. Well, if there was any doubt that you were a chemist, I think this slide pretty much uh, addresses all those doubts. Yeah, I do like my chemistry. Now, uh, I'm going to kind of continue on with uh, your oh. name slide here. Yeah, so here's Koichite. And again, when I originally found this, I did EDS on it, you know, and it said copper, silver, arsenic, sulfur, sulfur. And, and the ratios were such if you put copper and silver together, it's actually, and I did EDS, so I didn't have, you know, EDS with sulfur is not so great usually. So I didn't, with EDS, especially on a rough sample, on a polished mat, you don't really get reliable uh, quantitative information for um, sulfur salts. And so I got this, and um, being an idiot, I just said, ah, oh, it's just ten and tight. And now, of course, I will say that those of you who are not as stupid as I am will look at these crystals and say, yeah, don't really look like tenantite, like tetrahedratenantite group crystals, right? You know what? If, if you had to guess what they look like, in retrospect, you know, they actually kind of little, little, look a little bit like stanite, especially that this big crystal, that's the biggest known Koichite crystal, three millimeters, kind of yeah. looks a little bit like a stanite twin. And it turns out that um, after I had like put them in a box and, and sort of this, you know, forgotten about this, you know, when others analyzed this, they found, oh yeah, it, ha it has exactly stanite structure. And if you look at the formula, copper two silver arsenic sulfide, it's kind of like a stanite uh, chemical formula. And it turns out it's a, the structure is exactly like stanite. And um, so that was kind of a, a lesson for me that, you know, you've got to be really careful what you look at. And partly it was a lesson in that with EDS, you also just can't trust the, the quantitative results. Now, I will say I should have noticed that there's no zinc or iron or anything else in there, but I was just an idiot and I didn't notice it. And so what you see on the left-hand side is the largest Koichite crystal. It's about three millimeters. It's on Proustite, and actually it's on a specimen together with about one centimeter mangano quadratite crystals, which is another uh, silver silver salt from Uchuk Chakra. And you still have that in your collection? Uh, yeah, yes, that one I still, I, I have part of that in the collection. The other part um, was deposited in a, in, a, in a type collection. So, hmm. you know, fundamentally, uh, whatever was actually used for the description of the mineral, uh, you know, the part that was actually used in the description goes into a type collection and, you know, for obvious reasons at the moment, I'm depositing pretty much everything I study in the in the hard collection. But Vienna also quite, the British Natural History Museum has uh, quite a few of those, uh, and Vienna and then Harvard. That's where I deposit the actual type specimens. In fact, one numeral that we're not talking about here, I don't even have as part of that anymore because it was just one polished section and that is now um, in a type collection. <clears throat> gotcha. Let's move on here. So this, so if you look at the formula of this, so Koichite belongs to Stanite group. If you look at the formula of this mineral here, it looks very much like a, a Stanite group mineral as well. In fact, for those of the, those few who get ex really excited about black at least there's a mineral called uh, Hokartite or Perkitasite, which instead of manganese has iron or zinc in it. And so this has exactly the same type of formula, but Perkitasite and Hokartite, they also, you know, they kind of have a crystal habit like standard, except they're black. And what you see here are sort of these flattened crystals, right? These red, red crystals. Why didn't my video, did somebody yeah, turn me off? Frank, we lost your video. I don't know how that, yeah, you're, you're I, I don't know how I did that, but those are my, um, uh, yeah, I have skills. Um, <laughs> you should hear my, 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 my kids talk about me and my electronic skills for the fact that as my profession, I build highly sophisticated instruments 
that go under extreme conditions, they think I'm a total electronics idiot. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> when we see this, we see these orangey red crystals, actually very pretty. Now, I will say these are tiny, right? But they are very pretty color. Again, a silver mineral. Um, and the crystal habit does not look at all like, like a stannite group. And it turns out that stannite is derived from, so you, you have sphalerite, then you can go to. Oh, Frank, I think we lost your audio there. And who is doing this? I actually think Raquel is probably, you know, make. I can't do the gate on purpose, I'm sure. That's, yeah, that's we can't crazy. see her picture, so I'm, I'm sure she's cackling like a bruja. I'm so sorry, wasn't I? I'm so sorry. I swear, I wasn't even touching anything. My hands were up. I know, I wanted to spotlight you, and I missed it. Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so, um, so, you have sphalerite structure. From that, you can get to calcarite structure. And then you get the stannite. So they all, all the stannite group, coachite and so on, they're all sphalerite derived. But there's another uh, zinc sulfide um, um, structure, and that's woodside. And in nature, for zinc, there's, there's you know, tens of stannite type structures that are known as, as sulfides. But it turns out from woodside, the only one that's known is, is an argide. And it turns out that this is the first mineral of the stannite um, chemistry, you know, the, the silver, you know, the metal one, two, so silver two, you know, then you have something like iron, manganese, zinc, and then tin, germanium, whatever you want to have there. This is the very first one of that type that is derived from the woodside structure. And so initially we were, I was very, you know, the, the crystal habit certainly was more in sync with that. And luckily there's also a synthetic structure that at least, that at least has a very similar there's a slight difference in the crystal structure, but the synthetic structure also agrees with that. And I actually think one of the very interesting questions, uh, I've talked to people like John Racco and, and, and especially John Jasak about this. It seems like manganese, also in zinc sulfide, if you have manganese, it tends to probably stabilize um, the woodside structure, right? Um, compared to the sphalerite structure. At, at least there's sort of a correlation with that. And so it also seems that manganese, here also, it's, it's, it's a water well derivative, but also manganese is the difference that gives it that different structure. And yes, <clears throat> I know I get too excited about these things, but I think it's really interesting that you go from zinc and manganese, which in, a, in, in some senses for sulfide and, and sulfur chemistry are very similar in, in their behavior, but you go from zinc, you get the stannite struct, you get the sphalerite derivative, and you go to manganese, and you get the woodside derivative here. And you know what I can say is, I wish that these crystals existed in the same size as a smithite. But I have literally looked at thousands of Uchukchaka specimens, probably more than ten thousand specimens. Mm -hmm. And I and others have only found one specimen that has these on it, and there were like four or five. What are you seeing here is from what I've seen, pretty much the world supply of, of the sack man tonight, which, which is really sad because it would make, if that, that, if it was bigger, it would actually make for a very attractive mineral, I think. Um, well, I mean, from what we can see of it right now, it's absolutely beautiful. Just problem is a uh, little bit on the wee side. Well, yes. now, uh, Frank, yeah. we're gonna uh, we're gonna launch the poll, so uh, you may see a window pop up on your screen. You can just close the window, and then uh, we'll have you just uh, go on. We've got a few more slides here that uh, I close the window. Yes. Yeah. There you Remember, go. Remember, I have a chance of pushing wrong buttons. I will just emphasize that. I know, so but I think you're still push. on, so we're in good shape. Don't shit. push and pull, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and definitely don't twist. <laughs> All right. Ah. Uh, yeah, this is another, I mean, again, for those of you who like um, silver minerals and wear and weird minerals, you probably know algerodite, which is a silver germanium sulfide, really interesting mineral. And what you see here is a really, again, a really wacky chemical thing that I found fascinating in that you, you replace in, in algerodite, you have silver eight, germanium, sulfur six. Now, if you take germanium four plus and you supply it, so, you, you, you substitute half of that with arsenic 3 plus and half of that with arsenic 5 plus, that average is 4 plus. So you actually get kind of the same structure. 
And on this specimen down here, this was actually, again, I found this specimen on eBay and thought it looked kind of interesting and a little weird. Um, you have a prostate in the middle uh, on the right-hand specimen, and then you have a whole bunch of octahedral crystals, which you can't see that well, but all these crystals around the prostate are small, black, shiny octahedral crystals, very dark black. And we analyzed those, and it turns out this is this mineral spryite where um, germanium has been substituted by arsenic 3 plus and 5 plus. On the left-hand side, there's a specimen I find interesting. Can't really see them very well. On the top, there's sort of a whole bunch of argyrodite crystals. This is all over to Chakra still. You have a whole bunch of argyrodite crystals. Some of them have a very odd, um, very interesting growth of um, essentially triangles of, of pyrocytes sitting on top of them in an oriented fashion. And in the bottom, what you can see is that at the top, it's argyrodite. And the further you go down the specimen, the higher and higher the arsenic contents goes. And then you can see in the bottom, there's a really the black area down here, these are minute octahedral crystals with a pierside. That's pure end member of this. And if you go to one more slide, I want to show one really what I find so exciting. The cool thing structurally is, and I've shown sort of here an overlay of the germanium and the arsenic structure, sort of inter intermediate. So germanium is fourfold core and it has a tetrahedral sulfur arrangement around it. And arsenic three plus, arsenic five plus can do that as well, no problem. It sits exactly in the same position as germanium. Arsenic 3 plus has a free electron pair, actually can't do this. And so it has to bounce out of its position. And this is actually moved. This was a structure solved by Luca Bindi, a very difficult structure to solve. And so you can actually, they, they are partly distorted in a random fashion, uh, not in an ordered way, so it keeps exactly the same crystal structure. And um, the other thing that's really difficult with structure is that the silver ions are mobile, they're delocalized, they're actually not in any given crystalline like graphic position. They're sort of just form sort of, uh, it's, it, this is a solid iron conductor, so it conducts silver ions. But it's a really interesting example that I, again, I did not see this happening. I just couldn't understand how you could have a formula of silver eight, arsenic sulfur six, with the same structure as germanium until Luca Billy solved this. It was really a fascinating um, story. That is that is absolutely crazy. Now you got uh, one more image here uh, that uh, was discovered this year. Yes, so that, and and we did that a lot of that work actually at Harvard. I started uh, making sure that I can do structural data and other things at Harvard now. And this is a really this again. This I actually got this specimen again on eBay, <laughs> um, and it actually probably has the. <laughs> X millimeter, that's good. It has about a five millimeter crystal of mangano quadratite sitting on it in a very different way than usual. It's again, a silver sulfur salt type locality to chakra. So I actually got it because I saw this and I was like, that looks like mangano quadratite. So I got the specimen. You can see that it's probably among the world's best mangano quadratites. But then on that, there are little tiny areas. So you zoom in, you see there's, there's these green dots that just are my labels to look there. There's mm -hmm. something there. You zoom in more, you see a little bit of black crud. You zoom in even more, you get a mineral that's ramosite, and that fundamentally that is manganese frankiite, and with another new mineral out here. And that is one of those examples where it's virtually impossible to actually get the real structural data because it is so soft that when you mount this, or like that yard guide is also one of those minerals where when you mount this, the layers distort so much with respect to each other that you don't have a nicely oriented crystal structure anymore. Rather that it sort of nearly becomes amorphous due to the physical distortion. And so for this mineral, like with most Frankia crystallographic studies, the only thing you can get is sort of sub-information, sort of the, there are two sub-cells in the incommensurate structure, it's very complicated. You can get that, but it's enough to say this is analogous to Frankia, except there's only manganese in it, no iron. And so that's the latest one. I have one more very difficult mineral from which of chakra that we're trying to describe. It's another manganese sulfur salt, and um, we probably have to try to use synchrotron radiation to go after that. Now, Frank, this is all very unique to um, uh, Yucca Chakwa, but is Sumeb similar to, to this kind of situation? I think... <laughs> Sumat mostly is quite different because I think most of the interesting things there are um, 
I think most focus in, that people have studied on there is in the in this in the in the secondary minerals because that's really where the huge wealth and variety of sumac comes from. But there are very interesting primary minerals. You know, sumac is also unique for some of the primary minerals. Has you know that I think the germanium bearing phases that you get at sumac and some other things are quite unique uh, uh, at sumac. So there's also and in fact, I would nearly argue perhaps there hasn't been enough modern analysis of the actual ore minerals rather than the secondary ones at SUMEP. I think there's still a lot of potential even there. Now, Frank, I'm going to pull up a couple of images, and we didn't rehearse this at all, but I'm going to pull up a couple of images from a presentation that you gave, I think it was two years ago at uh, the SUMEP conference in Tucson. And uh, I'd like you to just spend, we're kind of getting close to the end of the hour, so I'd like you to just kind of quickly talk about these if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. And by the way, I am actually also free after that, but I don't want to ramble too long for everybody else and bore them with like at least. So this is a specimen. Um, well, the left-hand specimen. So Furotobayar is another specimen that we're actually also working on right now that used to be mistaken with Stromaya, right? And um, it's a very interesting mineral for which the crystal structure actually has not been solved. And so... Um, what you see here is some sort of these last like crystals. And I will say, the photos Bruce can cross hands on, on Mindak of this mineral are truly spectacular. And one of the things we're very interested in is getting some material for this to try and actually solve the crystal structure of this. It was originally described from Japan in, in all microscopic sections. It's also from, known from a few other places, all microscopically. But for, for these, Sumer has by far the world's best specimens where you can actually, you know, Again, in my world, these are big crystals. You can see them with naked eye from quite a distance, these needles, if you have an exceptional specimen. But again, the interesting thing is that actually the structure of this is not known, and we're actually in the process of hopefully getting um, our hands on a specimen where we can try to solve the crystal structure of this in the, in the very near future. Now, Frank, I'm just going to bring up one more image, and I think this is uh, very interesting because it uh, uh, it exemplifies what you were talking about when you're doing the thin slicing and the analysis of the slices. I, I believe that's what we're looking at here. Yeah, exactly. So this is this is a, again, a photo from that somebody on Mandat, but I've made many of similar polished sections. So you have these hand specimens of of from Tumadal, Renier, Germanite. They're they're actually quite attractive for sulfide because they're sort of purplish red and when you polish them you actually start seeing revealing a whole bunch of different you know things that are quite fascinating you can see you know that in this one it's neither it's you can't say it's either germanite or reniorite it's actually a, a very fine growth intergrowth of those and you can see a little bit of tenantite in there as well and i recently actually made a similar specimen it turns out it was the majority of it turned out to be this very rare ovambolite and I threatened Brian with this. I will show <laughs> now that people can see this. I'm very bad at my aim. If you look yeah. at this, this is the most recent thing I am profoundly excited about. Now, if there was a raise hand features here that we could use, I want to see how many people are excited. But actually, this is a specimen of essentially pure that I just got recently again on some on Erox. It was a um, it was just a black piece, but it looked really weird. It had an odd, odd look to me, and I got it, and it turns out um, that it's pure zincobriotide. The whole specimen consists of this mineral zincobriotide, which wasn't only described a few years ago by Chris Stanley and others, and it's just, and actually there's a, there are new minerals in there, which we'll see whether we can describe them, some really odd tungsten sulfides, copper germanium tungsten sulfides, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can get a large enough area to get structure from this. So uh, it's, it's, I know not, it's hot. I get very excited about these things because it's just, it's just cool. I like discovering new things. It's just a lot of fun. Well, Frank, I think it's, there are a lot of similarities that uh, uh, other specimen collectors would have because what you are such a great example of is the thrill of the hunt. You love finding something new or discovering something that might have been overlooked or not quite understood. And you talk to any collector around the world and they're always talking about the thrill of the hunt, the thrill mm. of the hunt. Yeah. And that's what you're doing, but you're doing it within the Black Uglies, which is 
very, very, very different. And you're fascinated by the chemical composition of everything and how just, you know, you can replace one for another and it does it turn it into a different mineral specimen or not. And I love seeing that passion in you. And I love having you on the show because it shows the passion in a little bit of a different way than we normally see with other uh, mineral collectors and mineral people out there. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I think, you know, and I think it's a good thing that everybody has their own way. I mean, it would be very boring if we all did, did the same thing, right? What a monotonous world that would be. And so I think everybody has to have their own little little twist. And yeah, I just really like, all minerals are something I'm really interested in. I think it's also somewhere where I can, with, it's also probably that, well, I really like being kind of good and extreme at what I do. And for these sulfur salts and sulfides, I have the knowledge to actually do new and interesting things. So, so, so it, it does that. And I can actually tell people here that, you know, if you have weird metallic minerals, I'm always interested in analyzing those. Don't, don't, you know, don't send me anything with oxygen. That is not because I actually really think they're not interesting. <laughs> it, I just think it's very hard. You know, I, I've had many examples where it's easy to get to a wrong conclusion. And in fact, Koichet is sort of one of these examples. And I just don't know secondary minerals. And so I'm just not the person to, to, to look at those. That, you know, I probably would, wouldn't be very helpful. But, you know, if people have, you know, weird rare minerals, I'm actually always quite interested in, in looking at some of those. It's, it, and it's, I think it's exactly what you said, Brian. It's that so it's hunt. Are you discovering something new? Is there something odd and interesting? And I've had a few cases where people send me things, and it turns out it's something uh, really new and interesting. Well, you know, I was going to ask you uh, what's something that the mineral community can do together to kind of improve our understanding of minerals. And you kind of answered that question already in the sense that. Uh, one thing that they can do is if they have uh, sulfur salts that they don't really understand or maybe they suspect is odd, send it to you for analysis. And maybe there's something that you find in it. And I, find, I think that one, one piece of advice that everyone in the mineral world will give to new collectors is always collect what you're passionate about. Collect what you care about. Collect something that you're excited about. Don't worry what other people say. Collect what you like. And... I look at the passion that you have when you talk about this kind of stuff and the excitement that comes out of your mouth and, you know, you're running a mile a minute and you're throwing out terms that I'm like trying to break down by syllables. And I absolutely love it, Frank. I think it's, it's fantastic. Great job. Yeah. And I will also say that one thing I really like is all the different people from all kinds of, what I like about the neural community is that in a sense, I think in many ways it actually brings together people that otherwise their, their lives would not intersect. And that's another part I really like. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's people from all kinds of different parts of life and what they're doing. And then there's this one thing that sort of brings them together. And I actually also really like that. I think it's, it's it, it makes it really interesting and, and fun. Absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, I always like to say that half of the mineral world is about the minerals and the other half is the social thing. And I love the fact that we are a global community that's connected in so many ways. And for the most part, we rise above the politics of our individual countries. And it's minerals that, that bind us and introduce us to each other. And I love developing that. So... Right on. We're in sync. Hey, um, I'm going to ask Raquel and Eloise if there are any questions before we go to the polls. Um, so if there's anything in the Q&A, Raquel, Eloise, that people want to ask of Frank, I think now would be a good time to, uh, to query him about it. We have many questions. So I, um, I don't know. We can, we can begin with a few of them and uh, maybe launch the poll. Well, just answer the poll questions just, just right after. The first question we had right away, even before we began, was from Robert Byers. He was asking um, us to ask you about your recipe for treating uh, pirate disease. I was trying to avoid that question. <laughs> that was a good <laughs> one. I'm was telling you. I haven't forgotten about that question. Well, the tough so, questions uh, come from Eloise. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I actually don't really have a recipe for treating pirate disease. And also, uh, essentially, I, in my collection, I only have pirate as an, as an accidental byproduct. 
I think it is very, once that pirate disease starts, I think it is extremely hard to stop that. I mean, I think you can, you know, you can try to put something, you know, oil or, you know, I, I think it's essentially unstoppable once it starts. And I think it's also, you know, one of the things that's challenging is some people think it's probably marcocide. It's very tricky because you can have some pyrites that never have any problems and others start having them. And I really don't think there's much you can do about this. I would sort of say fundamentally it's something then that I would that's why pyrite is something I, I and marcoside I really keep my hands off just because it doesn't survive often. Oh I hear you as a curator you know we try to avoid all pyrites and marcosites and because after we know that after 50 years 100 years you know, you open the drawers again and it's everything is has gone bad as you say like some of them uh, survive, but some just don't. And once they're next to each other, it's the end of all of them. So it's really, it's really hard. Um, another question from Anthony Albini was, what, who is funding your research? Uh, can we get, at what point was that? Was that probably about the stratospheric research? I don't know. Yes, what that was at the very beginning right. of the lecture. Um, this is all, um, at the moment, our funding all comes from um, um, the foundations. Um, you know, we get money for a number of foundations, and we, you know, we don't accept any anonymous foundations. We have very strict guidelines. We actually just published a whole document about what our funding rules are, and, and because the advisory committee did, did uh, you know, this advisory committee actually just did a thorough review of our. Um, funding sources to make sure that, you know, what I'm saying is that, you know, there's no, we don't want to have anybody have influence. So they actually did a very thorough review. It was a lot of work. We had you know, a lot of them back and forth. And I actually think we published, that's all being made public as part of this effort. So the best way is to look at, you can look up there who funds us. It's, 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 it's many foundations of various types that give us uh, the donation, the donations. And fundamentally, even with those, they have no say on on the research we do. It sort of comes in and it's decoupled. But it's a very important question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Frank. Next question by Thomas Berlinghaus. Um, so it's more related to uh, microscopy. So do you think it's better to uh, it's try to get better to actually, if you go back to reflected light microscopy, on the minerals and ore, um, going back to the old school. So um, Thomas is citing Schneider. I don't know. I'm sorry, my pronunciation is really bad. My my, yeah. my term is really bad. Uh, instead of using a sophisticated procedure and equipment as we do now. I, I think the answer is yes and no. I think, well, what you have to do is you've got to make a polish section. So with EDS and, and RAM, right, you know, it's very easy. You can just take a specimen and then put it underneath there and you know. You don't have to have a huge amount of preparation work. The disadvantage of doing that is that I would argue in many cases only in reflected light do you really know on a microscopic scale what's going on. You know, and this is both true for primary and secondary phases. If you think about what is that from Zubeb, um, the galloboidin butantide or something, which essentially is an integral of four different phases, which I think only two of them have been described by now. You will only know this if you do the microscopy. And, what I would say is it's yes or no, but I think definitely people should be using reflected light microscopy a lot. I think, or, or transmission light for you know thin sections for other things. You really can learn so much about what's going on, and in many cases you do it, and you don't need to do any any more complex study after that. The problem is it takes a lot of experience. It's a, it's a visual thing, and so it ha needs a lot of experience. So when I don't do reflected light microscopy for a while because sometimes I'm so busy that for a few years I actually don't have time to do it. It takes me quite a while to get back into it and get my eye back and, and, and know what's going on. So, you know, I, I think unlike Raman or EDS where you can put a sample under and you get a result, for reflected light microscopy, you need to have sort of this ongoing experience base. And, and in a sense that, I don't know, it sounds a little sentimental, but, you know, this fast lift, fast-paced world we live in, who has the time to sort of continuously do these things? You know, it's just not, I think it's just tricky, but I actually do think it's an incredibly, and I'll, I'll go on a little ramble on a tangent. So in the chemistry department in Madison where I was before, there was a, he described himself as an alchemist. 
So he was interested in really weird intermetallic phases and essentially did alchemy by putting them together and stuff. And he's tried to analyze those with, you know, crystallography and other things. And at some point, I told him, well, why don't you make polished sections reflect light? Because quite often he had, he didn't get any good data. And that's, again, because it was all these integrated growths of different things. And, you know, in, in metallurgy, it's still very common. So I do think it's a very powerful technique. It's, that should be used more, but it's also not the most trivial one to really use in a useful way. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, it's really important to look at your sample before crushing it and uh, you're doing a lot of uh, analysis, that's for sure. Uh, Brian, we have nine more questions. Maybe we should go through the poll first and uh, take the extra time if uh, Frank does have it uh, to answer the last questions. Absolutely, okay. I have time. That sounds good, thank you very much. Frank, you may not know how this works, but I have five more questions for you. These are going to be quick fire questions. So I'm going to throw out two options. You have to give me a gut reaction on which one you prefer. All of your answers are correct. These questions have been posted to all the viewers and they have tried to guess what you might answer. So all your quite all your answers are correct. It's the viewers that may be right or wrong. So as, are you as, ready? I to say, Brian, as a Harvard professor, I'm used to that approach. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> okay. Question number one, fish and chips or roast? Uh, roast. Roast. Good choice. Question number two, margarita or gin and tonic? Gin and tonic. Mm, G and T's. Question number three, holiday by the beach or up in the mountains? Very clear mountains. Oh, even though he's wearing a Hawaiian shirt there. <laughs> That's just a distraction. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm quite often distracted, as you can tell. Uh, question number four, Germany or South America? Ooh, that's really tough. It depends for what. Huh. Yeah. Something but I'm not going to give you the context. <laughs> what is that? Uh, do, 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 I think do, do. I'll just say South America. South America. Who <clears throat> gives up his homeland. Okay. Final question. Sulfur salts or silver minerals? Well, that's just unfair. <laughs> that's, like, that's like asking you which of your children do you like more. Like, you just, when did you stop beating your wife? <laughs> I think it's just, I mean, that's just a that's just not not nah. Do, 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 do. Probably, sul uh, probably sulfur salts. Sulfur salts. Okay, uh, that's just not right. <laughs> <laughs> there should be some law against questions like that. Yeah, I know, I know, but we like to break the laws. Eloise, do we have the poll answers ready? Yes, I think that Raquel should do it. Okay, Raquel, you're you're on deck today. Question oh, number yeah. one: What did the audience say? Fish and chips or roast? Roast. Roast. They got that correct. Ding, 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 ding. Yep. Question number two: Margarita <laughs> or gin and tonic? Gin tonic. Gin and tonic. So, uh, Frank, off the off the record, gin and tonic or, or whiskey? I think that's very much a question. Like, you know, gin and tonic is a summer drink, right? Okay. I, mean, I think it was partly invented against malaria or something like that. Um, Quinine uh, in, their, in the tonic. Yeah, exactly. So that's why in summer you have to drink gin and tonic so you don't get sick. <laughs> so I think it's a seasonal question. You know, in summer, probably gin and tonic and, and otherwise probably whiskey. <clears throat> okay. All right. Uh, okay. Question number three, holiday by the beach or in the mountains? In the Raquel. mountains. In the mountains. Wow. That's three for three. Wow. Uh, this, now we're getting to the tough ones. Question number four, mm -hmm. Germany or South America? Germany. Germany. <laughs> <laughs> They're all wrong because Frank's the only right one, correct? Final question, sulfur salts or silver minerals? It was 78% sulfur salts. Wow. Wow. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. That's four out of five. You now uh, know what to talk about uh, with Frank when you see him in Tucson. Uh, Frank, if you can hang out for a little bit afterwards oh, yeah. and answer one of the questions. Um, I, or do feel, you I, I now feel I'm, I'm, I'm very predictable. You're very predictable. I'm not sure I like that. Uh, uh, Frank, I think... We know you. It's not being oh, ridiculous. It's that we know yeah. you. We like. We love you. Yeah, <laughs> Let's put it that way. I do have to confess that it was Raquel who uh, custom created these questions for you. Ah, okay. But the so, audience. No, no. But this was the audience. That was not Raquel. Unless you guys 
you know, I don't know what, yeah, anyway, so, uh, yeah, hmm, all right then. All right, okay. Um, well, Frank, so you can hang out for a little bit. Let me just close the show, and uh, we'll go back to you for questions afterwards. We want to thank everybody for uh, joining us and for watching the show. Tune in tomorrow to Blue Cat Productions' YouTube channel, and we will have our uh, interview with Catherine Dunnell from the Royal Ontario Museum going live. That is tomorrow. And tune in next week, same bat time, same bat channel. And we have Tom Cressman and Christy Kramer from the Mineralogical Record who are going to be on this show right here. So for all of you out there, mahalo. Have a very safe and uh, wonderful Thanksgiving. And a uh, big thanks to Frank, who's going to hang out a little bit longer and take a few more questions. So, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do that. <clears throat> Okay, shall I continue then? Goodbye, everybody, for those who have to uh, leave us, but uh, we keep that going. So for those who can uh, watch the YouTube channel afterwards, they have the answer to that, their question, if they, even if they leave. So uh, John Atter had a question. Would synthesis of such minerals help? So I think he was talking about the sulfur salts. Uh, for sure. I think overall synthesis can help a lot. And that's actually also a little bit of something that isn't, isn't done quite as much anymore as it used to be. Um, <clears throat> you know, you never know whether you're going to get the same phase. You know, there are some phases in nature that people have really tried to synthesize and they can't do it. But overall, it, it could be very useful. I mean, and one, one approach for when you have very small minerals is that you can, you know, you could try to synthesize an amount where you can, can get a structure and compare the optical properties and you know, the, at least the unit cell size, but if you can't get the whole structure, you know, the, all those things, hardness, and that probably could go a long way. In fact, there's one from Spain. I don't know why I did that. I was pointing at Raquel, but nobody can see that. <laughs> pointing at Raquel. It didn't make any sense whatsoever. But there's a mineral that I've been trying to study from Spain. It's, again, in the in the in this standard group, it's called Barculite. It's a copper, cadmium, germanium sulfide, with really wacky chemistry. And there, the synthetic phase contradicts the preliminary finding from the mineral phase. And so I don't quite know what's going on there, but synthesis definitely can help. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, next question from Terry Wallace. Can you tell us what is going on with the copper sulfur bond in jornite, uh, digenite, and calcocyte? I plead the fifth. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a complicated that that is a long conversation, and I think it's quite complicated what's going on with that copper sulfur bond in there. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. I don't have a a useful answer here. You, you can have a long conversation over uh, yeah. gin and tonic during the summer with Terry Wallace. I think that's a uh, problem. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Um, is what Frank was saying about the germanium atom in the argyrite structure also applied to the tin atom in canfieldite structure? So the tin, the structures are probably identical. So tin has the same position as germanium. The thing, and then in the, in the spray act, you have this thing where one of the arsenics has to be displaced. Again, and there was another question that I think was the question is a metacrystal. In some sense, you could... It's not quite metacrystalline because it has a this clear place where it goes, but it's sort of random whether it's there or not. But the tin has the same position. The thing that is both really difficult in Canfield and Algerodite is that when you try to take a crystal structure at room temperature, what, you know, you get the, the X-rays are diffracted by the electrons, right? The electrons bounce them off. And these silver atoms in Canfieldite and, and Algerodite, they're mobile. They're actually not in a position. They're, moving around. So in both of those, you, at room temperature, you actually don't really get a position for the silver atoms. It's it's really challenging. And in addition, the reason I will just say, so the tin is, to ask, answer your answer question, tin is in the same position as germanium. So in the sense, the germanium tin are boring positions. Uh, the arsenic is interesting, and the silver is complicated, and um, the th other thing that makes both of these structures usually why it, it's so hard to solve them is that at the temperature they're formed, it's actually a cubic crystal structure. And at room temperature, they turn into an orthorhombic pseudo-cubic one. And what you actually get, what we got for spread, is a five-fold twinning as a result of that. And deconvoluting that becomes extremely complicated. And that's where Luca Bindi comes in to, sort, to, to take care of that. Oh, I see. 
Wow. <coughs> Um, John Jasksak uh, is asking, has uh, Zinco Briartite has been published yet? That's a good question. Zinco I actually think it may have, well, I mean, I, I think it, so it's IMA accepted, mm -hmm. but I actually think it may not have been published. And I was not part, just to be clear, that has nothing to do with my research. Okay. Um, okay. No, actually it was 2016, Mineralogical okay. Magazine, Andy McDonald. Yeah, it's published. Okay. Yeah. 2016. Okay, thank you. Uh, for all, you know, you can always go to um, either the IMA website or the uh, Mindat website, yeah. type in the name of the mineral and you will have all the information with the publication list and everything. So that's really useful. Uh, Brad Zinman is asking, would you call this a metacrystalline because of the arsenic bounce? Okay, I don't, I can't don't remember to what it was referring yeah, to. Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. Again, I think... It is not amorphous, but there's, and, and so what I would say, it, it's, it, it's it is crystalline. It's like a, so when you go, in a sense, it's a little bit like saying when you have a silver gold alloy, right? You, unlike copper gold, you don't get an ordered substitution in silver gold. It's sort of random. But crystallographically, it's still sort of one crystal that gives you a nice diffraction pattern. So in that sense, the arsenic is randomly distributed. It's not ordered, but it's still a crystal. It's still in a clear crystallographic position. So that's the way I would answer that. Okay. And Brad had another question. Uh, he's saying, I can see this type of crystals and chemistry existing on many exoplanets without atmospheres. We expect to find life. What do you think? I think for a number of the ones I'm looking at, that's... So the question is what defines whether you get an atmosphere or not. For, for a lot of these minerals, water is still really important. And it's, and I guess you could have liquid water within the crust somewhere without having an atmosphere, but it's a little hard to imagine because you'd probably think water at some point would escape, unless they're really cold. So it depends what you mean in the atmosphere. I, I, so I think you probably could get some of them, you know, you, but I actually don't, that, that, that's actually a very interesting question. <laughs> others think here who are real uh, mineralogists I'm, I'm not I don't quite know okay that's uh, I think that's going to keep you awake for the <laughs> night um, one maybe last question Stefan Nicolescu hi Stefan by the way um, is asking uh, back to the stratosphere why not gypsum instead of calcite <laughs> excellent question so the reason gypsum is not good is because that would also heat up the stratosphere just like sulfuric acid so the reason calcium carbonate is a good choice is that, so you don't want to absorb any sunlight. So the reason diamond is amazing is because it doesn't absorb any UV solar radiation and it doesn't absorb any terrestrial infrared because it only has like these few sharp, I mean, okay, it's going to be ultra pure diamond. It can't just, you know, you can't have nitrogen. It's going to be like the real thing. It's going to be the real deal. And in that case, they're perfect. Calcium carbonate actually has, it doesn't absorb any UV solar radiation. <coughs> It has absorptions in the terrestrial infrared, so the outwelling. But those are already optically thick because of CO2. So there's a coincidence that calcium carbonate doesn't really heat up the stratosphere because of that. Calcium sulfate, on the other hand, for the same reason, gypsum, sorry, for the same reason that sulfuric acid heats up, gypsum heats up. And so that, you know, what you would want to do for what you want, what you would do for stratospheric climate intervention is putting up a few million tons of this, which is more than the natural background of sulfuric acid. So this would result in um, a, a substantial heating of the stratosphere. That is exactly why, why gypsum actually is not a good choice. But it's a very good question. You know, there's probably a whole bunch of other mineral minerals or things that could be quite useful. I, I just went for the, in a sense, the most one of the most abundant, most obvious ones, but I'm sure there's other ones. <clears throat> Um, I think that was most of the questions. Raquel, do you see any others? I see maybe some. Yes, there are a in. couple of them. Another one from Joan Masake. What are the chances of Uchichuacua yielding more nice surprises in the future? 
I think if they return to mining these interesting high manganese ore bodies, I think there's actually a very good chance. I have, you know, we have at least, so there's one phase, you know, there's a few new phases that existed that we just haven't had good enough material to describe. So I think there's a very good chance for that. And especially if you get a slightly different, you know, uh, element kicking in again, I think it, it, it's, it's quite possible. I can tell you the one thing that I'm still pissed off at about, which you check about, is just, I didn't really go on this. I told you, as a sulfur salt person, Samsonite is, and I want to hear, I wish I could hear Jean talk about this. Samsonite is like, for me, the holy grail of, of sulfur salt minerals, right? It is just such an interesting story. And then it took Chakwa, it's all there, but there's, I haven't found any Samsonite, not even a hint of it. And so somewhere, that, I mean, so I'll tell you, there's got to be an antimony mangano quadratide. We know in small zones that that exists. There's the mangano living guy. There are all these different Uchuk Chakwa type phases. There's, um, there's this, probably a zinc type agmantonite, so with the, with the agmantonite structure. So there are a whole bunch of things there. So I think it's quite possible. I also think there's a chance for that. It could be not necessarily new minerals, but just amazing other minerals there as well in, in exceptional quality. Do you think any of those rare minerals have any commercial use? <clears throat> <laughs> that means what do you mean with commercial value? I think the rare minerals only have value if you find a rare mineral collector that's really exciting. That's the only commercial value that I think could exist. So I will say that, so the Argyrodite spryite, perhaps not themselves, but they actually have been studied quite a bit because of these very unusual properties they have. So the, the, these solid iron conductor properties and also synthetic argyrodite phases have been looked at quite a lot for this. And so I think the spryite idea with this arsenic and, 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 and this weird thing, I don't, probably nobody has looked at that yet, but it is an interesting question. And then probably yeah, and the last one. John Jasak is commenting that for stand, yeah, I mean, the synthetic stannite type structures for voltaic thermoelectric devices. So there are a bunch of sulfur salts that are being as synthetic phases, you know, being looked at for materials property. And in some sense, I think mineralogy, you know, mineralogy used to be this fundamental science that really told us about how the physical world works, right? You know, and in my opinion, mineralogy is, is sort of, a part of material science now. And I think material science is, you know, it, it's exactly the same problems that mineralogy studies. And so there's a lot of overlap between material science and mineralogy. And so, but I don't know what, yeah, the standard structures perhaps, but the things I discover, usually there's arsenic in them and that just makes them very challenging for any sort of commercial application. It's just not, that, that is still not, not a good starting point. Not healthy. <laughs> And that last question, which I kind of uh, reply, I did reply to Thomas, but I want to hear your point of view. Do you think we should go more into depth into super thoughts from to map again? Yes, I think, you know, I think there's been a real revolution in analytical instrumentation. And I think it's probably been a while since SUMAP or minerals have been investigated in great detail. And so I think it's probably actually. Um, that's something I'm quite interested in. I've started, you know, and I've started making a bunch of polished sections from mainly germanium ore sections, but I think that is something that's interesting and, and worth pursuing. Uh, sorry, we have one more from Stefan. Yeah. I think we need to, we owe to him. Okay, I'm gonna, can you read it? Yeah, uh, so, okay, Stefan, I can answer that. Yes, if you put gypsum in the stratosphere, it will cool down the surface. Right. These sulfates that actually came, that cooled after Chicks Club, where that was mainly sulfuric acid, right? Um, as well, which, the, uh, you know, so the problem is that atmospheric scientists call the aerosol in the stratosphere sulfate aerosol, which sounds like a sulfate mineral, but it's actually concentrated sulfuric acid. It's just that they've chosen to call it sulfate, which in a sense doesn't make any sense. But Yes, and you put gypsum in the stratosphere, for sure it will cool down the surface. But the thing it will also do is it'll heat up the stratosphere, and that will change stratospheric circulation, which is going, and we don't understand stratospheric circulation that well. And so it would have potentially profound impacts on atmospheric dynamics 
that you don't want to happen. Ryan, I think, and Frank, I think that we, <coughs> one hour and a half. So thank you so much, Frank. <laughs> that was really Frank. good. Thank you. As you've noticed, I like to ramble. It's fantastic. And I love it because um, we get a huge community that loves to get kind of the real scientific perspective. And Frank, you've done a wonderful job. Thank you for staying a little bit after and answering all the questions. I really appreciate you coming on the show today. It's actually my pleasure. I was, as you can tell, I really like talking about the things I get excited about. And uh, I, yeah, <laughs> perhaps more than I should. <laughs> never, never too much. Hey, keep up the great work. Thank you all your viewers. Thank you all the viewers for tuning in. Again, next week, we're going to have Tom Gressman and Christy Kramer from the Mineralogical Record right here on Mineral Talks Live. So come back and join us. Aloha. Have a fantastic Thanksgiving. So long. Thanks. Thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving.